Good afternoon from Washington, D.C. This is former Congressman Mike Ferguson. I'm the leader of Baker Hostetler's federal policy team. And today is the first of back-to-back -back days with fantastic guests on our webinar series, Baker Hostetler Bringing Congress to You. My usual co-host and uh, Baker Hostetler colleague, former Congressman Heath Schuler, had a last minute conflict. He's not able to be joining us today uh, for our very special uh, webinar with our great guest today, but um, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna plug ahead without him. Uh, and as some of you know, last week we heard from the House Democratic Caucus Chairman, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries from New York, and just as his caucus, the Democrats in the House were rolling out their proposal for the next phase of pandemic relief legislation. He joined us to talk about that a little bit. So it's perfect this week to follow up with his counterpart in the Senate majority leadership, the Republican conference chairman, Senator John Barrasso. Senator Barrasso is the third ranking Republican in the Senate as the conference chairman. It's a perfect role for somebody known for his policy acumen and a diverse set of areas. He's uh, certainly a healthcare expert. He's practiced orthopedic surgery for 24 years. He even served as the president of the Wyoming Medical Society. He's also a leading voice on energy policy, including as uh, chairman of the Environment and Public Works Committee in the Senate. He also serves on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee in the Senate, on the Foreign Relations Committee, and on the Indian Affairs Committee. So we're really looking forward to a great discussion today with somebody known as Wyoming's doctor, Senator John Barrasso. Senator, I think you may be on the line, and if I you am. are, Thank this you. is Mike Ferguson. Welcome Thanks, Mike. to our, our Baker Hosteller webinar. Delighted you could be with us today with everything you have going on in the Senate. Well, thanks. thanks so much. And you being a Notre Dame and a Georgetown guy, and I was a Georgetown and a Georgetown guy. But this is so happy to be <laughs> happy well, to as, be. As, as my Notre Dame friends would say, nobody's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, great, great institute. Georgetown is a great institution, obviously, and uh, loved my time there and uh, loved my time at Notre Dame. Good, good, good institutions and. You are you are certainly well educated. You've got a lot of different uh, policy areas of policy expertise, and uh, we're delighted uh, delighted that you're putting that to use, uh, not just for Wyoming but for the whole country. And delighted yes, you know that education only gets you so far in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, so, uh, Senator, I, we uh, understand you had a special guest at the uh, at the policy lunch today. Can you, can you tell us anything about that? Yes, I, yes, I'm happy to do that, and thanks so much for having me. I'll talk a little bit, and happy to answer as many questions as you, as you have. Yeah, the president attended our policy lunch today. Uh, we were in, so we were socially distanced, and uh, but it was it's always good to hear from the president, see what's on his mind, and he talked about a lot of different topics. Number one, getting the country back open again. We talked about testing, talked about vaccine, talked about how fast things are moving. The kind of the warp speed, but I'm happy to get into that if that's uh, if you have those 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 questions. But but it is, I mean it's you know for for you for Heath for people that are on the call looking at the list of names, you know you think you've seen everything and we've never seen anything like this. And we can talk about the the three years of the presidency of Donald Trump. We can also talk about what's happening now with the the coronavirus. And uh, it's reminiscent of Mitch McConnell during the impeachment saying to our Republican conference, look, by the time the election comes around in November, nobody's going to be talking about impeachment. And and he's right. The This is such a different time for the country. The first time the government have basically shut down the economy, uh, a disease uh, that spreads, uh, it's sticky, it spreads, it's hard to get rid of, uh, that um, is impacting America, uh, the number of deaths, uh, and, the, and there's no vaccine and no treatment, but uh, the, the speed of, uh, of coming up with all of those, and then reaction in Congress, which up until right before this past week has been actually pretty darn quick. For, for those of you who've been watching this institution for a long time, to think we could do three bipartisan bills in about a month, including one for um, over two trillion dollars to pass the Senate, 96 to nothing. It's it's remarkable that we were able to do that, and we have put in programs that have worked pretty well. The Paycheck Protection Plan has worked well. 
money to the states, $150 billion. They're still trying to decide how to spend uh, money to hospitals, both those that are impacted by the fact that the disease has been uh, devastating them. And you see that in New York and on the news and in Detroit and in New Orleans. And then the disease, the, the hospitals that have essentially shut down because they've had nobody with coronavirus, but they had to stop elective procedures, which is their money making. And that has been, been two months of no income. So they laying off hundreds and hundreds of employees. It happened at University of Rochester last night in New York. So the the government has had to step in and try to be helpful in lots of different ways, trying to avoid the unintended consequences when government does a lot. Sometimes you end up doing too much or sometimes too little. Direct payment checks to what 140 million people. The um, Even in Wyoming alone, we've had 11,000 of these PPP loans, uh, over a billion dollars. You wouldn't have thought that was uh, conceivable, but the, but it, but it's worked. So we've been trying to focus on a rescue operation, a relief operation, and then the next step is going to be recovery. There are no timelines yet for the recovery bill. Nancy Pelosi kind of dragged a $3 trillion liberal wish list across the House floor last uh, Friday. For a lot of Democrats, it didn't go far enough. Uh, Ocasio-Cortez called it an opening bid. The, um, but then about the 13 or 14 Democrats fra that just picked up seats last time in Trump districts voted against it. The, it almost reads like a campaign platform rather than an effort to really get the country open again and deal with the, with the disease. The, what Republicans are focused on, if, you know, the next piece of legislation is some liability reform. Uh, Wyoming had our, our special session of the legislature this Friday and Saturday to talk about the 1.25 uh, billion that we got, but also talk about liability reform to give some protection to those folks, uh, healthcare workers as well as businesses uh, that open up again uh, if they use basically common sense uh, and safe practices that are outlined by state or local health officials that uh, that they they get immunity from lawsuits uh, unless there is truly wanton disregard, or willful misconduct. Uh, that kind of act activity. And, and we're trying to do that from a national standpoint so you can get businesses open um, again, the country open again. When you know you look at the bio sheets on both uh, Heath and Michael at the bottom, it just in the asterisk says, not an attorney, not an attorney. But you see some of the, the sue and settle law firms that have put out uh, advertising now, basically, if you have coronavirus, you know, there must be somebody you can sue. And we just can't allow that to paralyze uh, the country. So I'm happy to get into the legislation. I'm happy to get into the issues of, of a recovery bill, if you'd like, and uh, talk regularly with the president, including today. You know, he's a big fan, as am I, of infrastructure and how to do that. As, and as chairman of the Environment and Public Works Committee, we have a highway bill that we've reported out full 21 nothing. every Republican, every Democrat. We have water resource bills that have been reported out of the committee, 21 nothing. every Republican, every Democrat, which are the basis for what the president would want to use for uh, an infrastructure stimulus plan, which puts money directly into the states through a funding formula that works, works pretty well. And these are projects that are, that are ready to go. So with that, I'm happy to open it up to, to questions or talk more about anything you'd like. Well, sure. Thank you. That was a, a breathtaking overview of a number of different things. I would love to to talk a little bit more about in, in a little bit more detail. You talk about uh, protecting businesses and healthcare providers from these uh, lawsuits, in some cases, frivolous lawsuits related to the virus. I know Republicans have really made that a priority in the different conversations, negotiations, whatever we want to call it. Um, tell us a little bit about what what the conference is proposing, what Senate Republicans are looking for. I mean, you have a, in some ways, a unique perspective on this, right? You're a, pra you're a practicing surgeon. You led the Wyoming Medical Society. Um, what do business people and healthcare providers, what do they need to, in, in terms of this protection from lawsuits, to, to be able to open back up and get the economy going again? Yeah, we think from a, from, it's, I think some states are going to do this anyway, and Wyoming has just done, uh, and it talks about businesses, healthcare providers, anybody who is acting in a good faith effort uh, in responding to the, this health emergency, that uh, that they would be immune from liability arising from uh, from the, their activity 
uh, of course, they're, if, as long as they're following instructions of either the state or the city, the town or the county health officer. But it's uh, so you'd get immunity there, but not for acts of uh, gross negligence or willful or, or wanton misconduct, but it just kind of raises the level of the bar for what you could be sued for so that companies can feel comfortable opening for business, opening, uh, you know, the restaurant opening, the store opening, realizing that uh, you open an economy, the no infection rates are going to go up. They're going to, we have more testing now available. And the president talked about that today. The, uh, the reality is we're testing about a million people every three days. So every three days you're testing about a million people. The entire month of March in the United States, only a million people were tested. So now we're doing, you know, 10 times that amount. So you're doing more testing. You're finding more, and some people who are asymptomatic, you're finding more cases. So the numbers are going to go up. And uh, if somebody is symptomatic, they may want to look to somebody. It's just it was interesting, uh, the number of, of uh of advertisements that are out there and the number of suits that have already been been filed. I mean, you know, you take a look at, uh, you know, the, the college football, college with Heath's background. The, the, the fact is that one of these ads said, you know, if you were sent home from college prematurely for the end of the year, you know, sue your college. Well, that's every college student in America was sent home right. prematurely this year. Right. So it's... It, um, there seems to be an overreach, at least in the advertising. And the you're stuck at home, call this 1-800 number and ask for a free consultation. So the the concern is, if you're a small business owner that you, uh, that wants to open up, but you're afraid that you're going to get sued uh, because there's likely going to be more people testing positive as people kind of come out and re-engage. In spite of you doing everything you think is right, uh, it may not work out perfectly. So you might have an employee. Uh, who who uh, at some point tests positive. You may have a uh, customer that tests positive, and how you can tell whether that happened where you're where they at, at work or in your shop or your restaurant uh, or someplace else is almost impossible to prove. So you talked a little bit about uh, healthcare providers beginning to open back up, uh, elective surgeries, uh, so-called elective surgeries. Some, of course, are. <laughs> not just by choice, they're very, very necessary. Uh, some stakeholders in different states are finding that some of the states or even individual facilities are being pretty prescriptive in their requirements for patients, for staff. You're a surgeon. W w w how do you strike that right balance in, in allowing uh, folks to get the health care that they need to, and, and to, to be safe uh, at the same time? Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right because you think about elective surgery and some people may mean, well, that means, you know, some plastic surgery or something that's elective. But, you know, in Wyoming, you can't get a mammogram. Can't get a mammogram. Haven't been able to for a couple of months The um, because that's a procedure that uh, that's, those areas have been shut down. Uh, colonoscopy, uh, biopsy for a skin lesion that may turn out to be cancer. So the doctors I'm talking to are concerned that, that by people putting off things that are defined as elective because they're not emergency, but uh, to that person is very meaningful that uh, you want to get those things done quickly and you're worried about delay in diagnosis. So that's part of, of this of this whole thing. And we have hospitals that are in com in communities where they have no one has been admitted to the hospital with coronavirus, zero. But for two months, they've been on an emergency basis only. So they're at 20% occupancy, which means they're not doing the things that bring in and generate the money. So they're laying off doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, physical therapists, uh, personnel that cook food, all, lots of different areas. And these hospitals in small communities work on slim margins, which and in the last 10 years, I guess about 200 hospitals in the country have closed. Uh, now, of those 200, 200 of them are in small communities. The rural, they tend to be rural hospitals. Uh, after the Obama health care law was passed, uh, the, the so-called architect of that law, uh, Zeke Emanuel's, Rahm Emanuel's brother, wrote a book and he said there are a thousand too many hospitals in the United States. A thousand need to close. Well, 200 have the rural hospitals. And if a rural hospital closes, in that small community, which you know, the next hospital may be 40, 50 miles away, it's much harder for that community to attract, recruit, t 
teachers, nurses, small businesses. It really is, starts a downward spiral in a community because often the hospital is one of the biggest employers, if not the biggest employer, along with the school district. So we're doing a lot. Uh, and, and again, this isn't a partisan issue. This is a bipartisan issue with regard to Tina Smith and I from Minnesota, Senator from Minnesota, and I work closely on this and have been working with Health and Human Services to make sure of the CARES Act money for hospitals, that it didn't just go to the big cities where they're treating a lot of patients, but it also went to the small rural communities where the hospitals find themselves on the verge of bankruptcy because the the, the part of the business that pays, that pays the bills uh, basically was, was been pulled away from them uh, by the government saying shut down. Well, health healthcare obviously is an issue that you spend a good bit of time on because of your expertise and your training. Energy is another area you, I know, spend a lot of time on because of your constituents and your state and your committee assignments. It's um, it's been a little bit lost for some in the in all the pandemic news, but uh, you know the re some of the recent actions by the oil producing countries have really roiled our energy markets, really disrupted a global uh, economy when it comes to energy. What, are there things that Congress can be doing, things that you're focused on to help the American energy industry try to stabilize as it faces this sort of dual trauma between the pandemic and the destabilized oil markets? Well, you're, you're absolutely right. And we talked about that uh, today at lunch with the president and uh, a number of us uh, brought it up. Uh, Senator Hoven talked about it from North Dakota uh, and others, but he was the point person on that part of the discussion. The president clearly understands and laid out the whole uh, deal of energy, but you're right, it's a double whammy. Uh, number one is the fact that the demand for energy has dropped precipitously as airplane travel in the United States has dropped dramatically as a result of coronavirus. And not, I should say, not just the United States, but in the world. So the average demand for energy, the use of uh, oil in the United States, in the world, prior to the pandemic, was about roughly 100 million barrels a day. 100 million barrels a day of oil is used in the United, used worldwide. As a result of the pandemic and the diminished people of driving and flying, the demand has dropped to about use has dropped to about 75 million barrels a day. So you got 25 million barrels a day that were being produced that aren't there's no need for. Additionally, both Russia and Saudi Arabia decided to produce more, which as you saw a couple of weeks ago in the United States, the price of oil was actually in negative numbers. That's because of the contracts that people had and they didn't want to take delivery of the oil. They didn't have any place to put it. So they were paying people to take the contracts and then storage was an issue. Uh, 13 of us in the, in the energy sector and the senators from Texas and Oklahoma and Louisiana, Wyoming, Alaska, the Dakotas, uh, we're all on and working uh, feverishly with the Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia ambassador, with the energy minister from Saudi Arabia, with the White House, the president, with Putin and with the uh, crown prince in Saudi Arabia, all in an effort to stop, to slow production in Russia and in Saudi Arabia, but as the, uh, and the, as the president refers to it as OPEC plus, which are the OPEC countries plus others that are involved, Mexico is involved, Russia's um, involved, to uh, to try to get to a point where the um, energy can be produced at a level where it's still profitable to produce the uh, the energy price today is a little over thirty dollars a barrel, but it's going to take a while for the demand to return. Um, you know, I've flown. Each weekend to Wyoming, the last three weekends, the, the flight schedules are dramatically cut. The, uh, there are five senators on the plane each Thursday afternoon from the, the Wyoming to Denver, and then from there we spread out to where we're going to go, catch either in other flights or drive. But uh, what we see, we each get a row to ourselves. We have masks on, and so there's the protection there, but there's very few flights, and the flights are not very full when you each get a row to yourself. So before you get the demand for oil up, you know, you're going to have many more people flying. You need to have many more people flying and more flights uh, as well. And we're not there yet. The president talks about a V-shaped recovery with pent-up demand. I think there's pent-up demand, but there's also concern on behalf of, of folks to say there are things I'm not going to do. I want the country to open up. I want to get back to a normal way of life. 
but until I'm ready to go into a stadium with 60,000 uh, strangers so I can, you know, cheer on Heath, um, those days are going to be, uh, you know, that's, I'm not quite there yet. I don't have that comfort level yet. Whether that means that we have to have a vaccine that works and they're working very quickly on that, and I can talk about that, whether it's we need to have a treatment that'll work and that is getting better. The, uh, and the president's very optimistic about that, uh, more testing, and, and we're gearing up significantly the, now that the private sector is involved. All of those things are going to br bring back the economy, but I think I see it more like a swoosh, the Nike swoosh, rather than a sharp V, because until people feel comfortable hacking into a stadium, a movie theater, college dormitory, and, and whatever, uh, I don't think we're, we're back to the robust, strong, healthy, growing economy that we were at prior to uh, the coronavirus. Another area in the energy world that you've done work is uh, in nuclear energy. We're going to have uh, your colleague, my home state senator from New Jersey, Cory Booker, will be on tomorrow on our webinar with us. And I know you've done some work with him on, on nuclear energy, in particular advancing innovation in nuclear energy. Are you optimistic uh, this year or in the near future about moving forward with some of that new technology in the nuclear area? Yeah, a lot's been done uh, in the field of, of nuclear energy and with Wyoming being the number one uranium producing state in the country, that's an area of great interest uh, to me. And for some that are very focused on climate change uh, and Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island, uh, Bill Gates, Microsoft, uh, both will talk about the fact that if you really want to be serious about climate change, you cannot get to the levels of reducing carbon dioxide emission unless you use nuclear energy. 20% uh, of our electricity is a result of nuclear energy in the United States, and it is zero carbon. You say, what are the zero carbon sources of energy? Most people think of wind and solar, but nuclear is a multiple above uh, wind and solar in terms of the amount of electricity that is generated uh, for nuclear. You know, Bill Gates has been a big investor in that next age of nuclear reactors, kind of the modular approach, uh, the, and those are being built some different places around the world. The, uh, there are some folks who are against nuclear energy, and Bernie Sanders is one. The, uh, and the, po the point being that you can't be uh, looking for honest solutions on climate change unless you're going to include nuclear energy. And we just want to, from the committee standpoint, and we've passed bipartisan legislation uh, on that, say that we want to make sure that the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, has um, in place all the things that they would need to go out with that next generation and examine and make sure they're safe and done well, because that's the, that's the goal, is to have this new generation being ways that are, that are safer, cheaper forms of electricity as well. Yeah, you just, I know you had just very recently praised the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission for deferring collecting of fees from operators after you and some of the other leaders uh, asked them to do so. Do you think Congress, uh, any chance Congress is going to appropriate funds to, for the NRC instead of these collections from nuclear plants given the, the pandemic and the, and the crisis that we face? Well, we're, we're continuing to work on that. You know, the interesting thing is the NRC has a budget, and they raise the budget every year. But as certain nuclear power plants have basically been mothballed, been shut down, decommissioned, if you will, you have fewer nuclear power plants and and a higher budget, higher fees every year. So when you divide the <laughs> divide the the bigger fee among fewer power plants, if you know if they make it more and more expensive for each individual power plant. You know, you don't want to get right. to the point where you have one power, only one nuclear power plant, and it's paying the whole for the, the the whole fee for the whole country, the whole Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So they get it, they understand the math. They also re realize that we need to find ways to make sure that the that they stay viable and can do the job. But if they have to look at fewer nuclear power plants in terms of updating and uh, doing all the the uh, the regulatory uh, observations, then then it sh they shouldn't have to spend as much. Right. You're going to hear from the uh, EPA administrator in your committee uh, coming up. Any idea what do you expect to hear from the administrator or what you plan to ask him? Yeah, I, there'll be a number of things. Andrew Wheeler will be in front of the committee tomorrow. 
and um, I have a list of a list of questions that re relate to a variety of items that we're hitting. Uh, I'm sure the renewable fuel sir. Uh, Fuel source will be part of it. We're talking about ethanol and and uh, the blending, the at a point where fewer and fewer gallons are being used of overall products to to power vehicles. How much of that is ethanol? How much has to be blended? Uh, is going to be a question because the the blend amounts over the course of a year is kind of a finite number, <laughs> whether people are driving or not. So you have a a level of use this year which is down. We have, even for funding of the highway bill, the amount of money in the, going into the highway trust fund this past month has been the lowest it's been since the 1990s. Well, why? Because people aren't driving, because people are shut down and staying at home. You don't have rush hour. It's easier to get around Washington. People who are driving say, boy, it's pretty nice. There aren't that many cars on the road. But from the standpoint of funding um, a highway bill and transportation, the highway trust fund isn't bringing in much. So we'll be talking to Andrew certainly about the, the, uh, the RFS and the issues related to that. But usually members will have their specific questions related to what's going on in their home state and projects, as well as some overall questions about the EPA with oversight. There'll be questions about the Army Corps of Engineer and projects that should have been done and haven't been done yet or where, where the holdups are in getting permits so all of those things are the sort of things that come up when Andrew is is there, and uh, the and obviously the uh, depending on which side of the aisle you sit, the questions can either be favorable or unfavorable. <laughs> that's right. That's that's always the way it works, right? The um, I have to ask you about China. You serve on the Foreign Relations Committee. China, of course, is in part of many many conversations on Capitol Hill and around the country these days. How do you see? I mean, you even said, you know, that the coronavirus uh, has made it clear that our current relationship with China is built on a house of cards, I think you said. How, how does our relationship with China change? I mean, it's very delicate, obviously. It's very complicated. We've got trade negotiations going on with China. They're a, obviously a major player in everything going on in the world. Um, how do you see our relationship with China changing as we move through this crisis? Yeah, and our economies have been you know, linked closely in the past. The uh, in the fact that well, they like our customers because we're wealthy. We like their customers because there's lots of them. The but I think what we found with coronavirus is that China cannot be trusted. The what had happened, the way they uh, hid the uh, hid what happened with coronavirus. You know, I mean, they shut down airplane flights within China, but allowed. Wuhan to fly. You couldn't fly to other places in China from Wuhan, but you could fly overseas. I mean, they're just uh, there's so many questions that you just say, I can't really trust these guys. We know that their their strategic goal is to become the military, economic, and technological superpower of the world. I mean, that is their that's their goal. That's how they've been uh, focusing their activity. They uh, try to quietly proceed with their different sorts of power. Uh, you know, you see their activities in the South China Sea. You see their uh, additional activities with cyber. The, I think we have to be much more careful and make sure that we are never dependent upon China again for specific critical medicines or materials, uh, things that are important for our economy. Uh, that may mean people are going to have to pay more for certain things. I mean, we talked to the president today at lunch, and he talked about finding ways to uh, lower the cost of prescription drugs. Well, one of the ways that we have in the past tried to keep down the cost of prescription drugs as a nation was having those drugs produced overseas in, in other locations instead of in the United States. So that's going to be one of the trade-offs that we're going to have to decide about and uh, what will people want in terms of, you know, not just today but five years from now in terms of making purchases and how much of that are we willing to want to pay more for something that's to protect ourselves from from uh, from China and, and and sources as well. I mean, if you're relying on uh, different countries around the world for different products, I think you have to be careful about supply chains. And there's a real discussion now going on. And you know, Tom Cotton has been very active uh, and vocal about his his efforts there. And Marco uh, Rubio has been been working that as well as other members of the Foreign Relations Committee. 
yeah, you know, you mentioned supply, the supply chain and it seems like every policy conversation these days, it's supply chain, supply chain, always supply chain. And specific, specifically when we're talking about this, this uh, crisis with China um, and that trade off that would come with the costs uh, that we would pay for products, whether it's medicine or other things, m- moving that supply chain onshore. I know the uh, Peter Navarro and others in the administration at the White House have been talking about an executive order. Are they coordinating that with you leaders on the Hill? Um, I haven't talked to Peter about it, but uh, there's a lot of discussion going on. Yeah, there sure is. The um, you, you had mentioned uh, Speaker Pelosi's bill that uh, the House passed last week, and I know that Senator McConnell was pretty pretty unsparing in his criticism. Of uh, of the bill, I it echoed. Uh, I know he's, uh, you've echoed some of that in, in your uh, comments here today. What what is the Senate process? We've the House has showed us what their process was, was going to be. That you know it was essentially a Democratic bill uh, had virtually no Republican support. Um, what is the Senate process going to be for whatever might happen next? Will there be another bill that moves through the Senate? And what is the timeline? And what would the process look like for something like that? Yeah, well, and there there may actually be another bill coming through the Senate. We talked to the president about it uh, today. Talked a bit about the timeline. The, the um, there is still hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars from the first three three point five bills that have passed that have have not gone out the door. So you have this uh, coronavirus three point five that passed a couple of weeks ago that had the additional money in it for paycheck protection, there's still $100 billion of that that is not going, that people have not taken up yet. Of the money for health care, there is still $75 billion for hospitals, none of which has gone out yet. There is $150 billion from the first uh, CARES Act that went to the states, and the states are still trying to figure out how they're going to spend that. Wyoming has spent none of it. The, the amount of money is so big that we have it in a uh, savings account at one quarter of 1%, which is like no interest. But the, the interest at a quarter of a percent on $1.25 billion is $9,000 a day. So that tells you how much, how big of a dollar figure this is. And we've had a special session this Friday and Saturday to come up with ways of how we're going to spend it. Other states are doing the same thing. So uh, I don't know exactly what percentage of the whole dollar figure approved has not yet been spent, uh, but it can be up approaching half of all of the money not yet not yet spent and additional money from the Federal Reserve available for, for, fi- for financing of various various things through the Federal Reserve. So there's uh, plenty of money still heading into the system. And I think the, there are folks that are saying, look, before we approve more, let's get an accounting to see how much where the needs really are uh, before we decide, does the pe- does the paycheck protection thing need more money? Does the uh, uh, do we need more money for testing? There are nine billion dollars for testing that's not gone out the door yet through Health and Human Services as of last evening. The, that's the sort of thing that we're saying. Why do we need to pass another piece of legislation when the money isn't even out and some of the money that's out has not yet been used? So uh, you know we're not talking about trying to rush into adding more to the debt. Uh, and what Speaker Pelosi came out with her $3 trillion bill that has, you know, you look at the laundry list of things that are in it. It's direct paychecks to illegal immigrants. It's raising taxes on small businesses. uh, It's uh, studies for diversity for marijuana. They use the word marijuana or uh, uh, cannabis 68 times in the bill, more than they use the word jobs. It's taxpayer funded abortions, $50 million for environmental justice, money for the the Postal Service, the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for Humanities. You can discuss all of those things, but to me, those aren't issues related to the impact of the coronavirus on our society, plus a billion, uh, I'm sorry, a trillion dollars for, for cities and states when the first 150 billion has not even been, been spent. So the it did seem to me like it was just a political document and an unserious proposal by Nancy Pelosi to uh, to put a campaign uh, basically platform together to say hey this is who we are this is what we're going to run on 
and have a marker to say, Joe Biden, this is going to be your platform and you can stay in the cellar, but I'm Nancy Pelosi and I'm the Speaker of the House and I'm going to be running the country if you happen to find yourself elected president. Well, we certainly know that you and Leader McConnell and others will will be uh, conducting a serious process in the Senate. That has been your hallmark and you've done a lot of good and we very, very much appreciate your time. We know how many demands on your time there are and uh, how many areas of policy We've just a few that we've discussed today, and you're involved in so many as one of the leaders in the Senate. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us and with our audience, and we hope you and your Senate colleagues stay healthy and continue to do all this work on behalf of the country. Senator John Barrasso, thanks, thanks so much for being thanks with for us today. Me. Well, before you know it, we are going to be back tomorrow uh, with my home state senator, one of my home state senators, Cory Booker. Uh, it's, it's great timing uh, in these last few webinars we've had. We've had the Senate Republican perspective tomorrow. We're going to hear from Senate Senator Booker to hear some thoughts from the other side of the aisle. So please come back and join us. That's tomorrow, May 20th at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You can still register. And uh, remember to send us your questions for Senator Booker on the registration page. Uh, in the meantime, please feel free to contact us at the federal policy team here at Baker Hostetler if you have questions about any of these topics or any other needs. We look forward to you having, uh, having you with us again tomorrow. Thank you and good afternoon from Washington.